Blog Talk Radio. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Last First Date Radio, featuring interviews with experts in dating, relating, and mating in midlife. And now, here's your host, Sandy Weiner. This is episode number 382, Guiding Women at a Crossroads into the Next Stage of Life. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I am Sandy Weiner. Welcome to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late for love and that a woman of value naturally attracts the respect and rewards she deserves in life and love. This is the final show for 2019. Oh, my God. The year is ending. And what a year it's been. What a decade it's been. And we're entering 2020 which to me, there's something really special about 2020, like having 2020 vision and 2020 looking ahead. Um, I'm pretty excited about the new year, and I hope you all are too. And I'm excited about our guest today, but before I bring her on, I wanted to share my weekly tip on how to be a woman of value. And this week's tip is let go of toxic people. We've all been through the holidays just now, and we might have seen a few toxic people in our lives, and especially if you have a family member or two who are difficult to be with. So sometimes it's harder to let go of them physically if they're in your family, but you certainly can let go of them emotionally. You don't have to absorb everything that a person says to you, does to you, and take it personally because these people are limited. So if you can actually walk away from a toxic relationship where it's like romantic or a friendship, then I recommend you do that and do it with grace. This is something I love working with women on. And if it's a family member, limit your time with them. Limit your emotional capacity to be with them. Like really just stop absorbing all the garbage and you will enter into the next phase of life with so much more peace of mind. And before I bring on my guest, Dodie, I want to invite you, if you're not already a member, to join my free Facebook group. It's called Your Last First Date, and we have about 3,000 members. And it is a positive, wonderful place to get support, positive support. It's not a place for venting and just bashing on men, on dating and complaining. Um, That's not something we tolerate. It's a place for kindness, for compassion, and for learning new skills in the dating arena. So join us at your last first date. And now for my guest, Dodie Lamb. She is a social worker. She has postgraduate training in psychoanalytic psychotherapy. She also has training in mindfulness meditation, CBT, and positive psychology. She's also an adjunct professor in psychology. Over the years and throughout her journey, she has nurtured her true loves, her private practice, and a double ristretto over ice. She works with women and helps them achieve their goals, and she loves seeing women take flight on whatever path they choose. And because of that, she has recently developed an online course for women called Women at a Crossroads, and it begins on February 3rd. And there is a link in the, um, in the show notes, and there will be one when I post this show on my blog, but it, if, you, if you are just listening, you can go to dodielamb.com forward slash women at a crossroads course. Welcome to the show, Dodie. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. And this is one of my favorite topics, crossroads, because so many of us, all of us have been at a crossroads at some point in our life. And um, so first I want to ask, like, what drew you to doing this work to working with women who are at these kinds of crossroads? Well, I I think it started, I've lived in many different communities, and often I would see women who who were doing what they were supposed to do in their lives. They were wives and mothers. They were doing it well. But there was an unhappiness, I felt, even even as an adolescent, an unhappiness and a frustration that I saw with them and maybe some low-grade depression. And um, I said to myself, you know, this is not going to be me. Whatever it is, whatever I'm going to do, this is not what I want for myself. And, you know, over the time, I noticed, you know, I love to read 
um, about strong women or women, you know, like Virginia Woolf or women authors or um, women political commentators, and um, and it just inspired me. And I started on this on this trajectory. Then in my private practice, I saw women, you know, all types, and there was a theme, and the theme was that women would come to the crossroads. Sometimes they didn't know they were at a crossroads where they needed to make a decision. They didn't know there was a need to make a decision, but they were unhappy, and they couldn't pinpoint what it is that was making them unhappy or why they were unhappy, and, um, I, and I saw a pattern. And so you saw pat- what, <clears throat> patterns in in what made them unhappy? Yeah, you know they were they were um, they were at this crossroads. So a woman who might be at a crossroad might be somebody who was going through a divorce, and she doesn't know. You know her life has turned topsy turvy, and she's you know beyond the getting by stage when you get divorced. You know putting plugging the holes and putting the band aids on things, and then she's looking at herself and saying and this is not the life I wanted, but I don't know what life I do want. This is not what I expected. And I just went on my life and did everything kind of by rote. And, um, and now I don't know where I'm at or, or specifically empty nesters that this often comes up with them, women who are devoting their lives to their children and to the household. And the kids are leaving the nest a little bit later these days, but they're leaving the nest. And then, um, these women are they're looking at themselves and they're saying who am i and what am i going to do and what is my purpose and sometimes they try to fill it you know with with different hobbies and stuff but it's not really filling the filling you know their soul really and mm-hmm. um not connecting to it so that would be you know somebody else who might be at a crossroads hmm. you know so yeah this can you happen, share some you know, Yes, yeah, so share some some other. These are great. So, I like how you're differentiating between it's not just divorce. It's because divorce requires, you know, like the end of a relationship and the business part of it and what to do with the kids. But then there's you. Like, what what's next yes. for me? What is my life now? And how do I fill my soul? So we have we have divorce. We have empty nest. And uh, what else? Have, what else do you see? Right. So let's say somebody who's getting fired from a job, they get fired from a job and, and maybe they say to themselves, do I like this, this line of work? Do I want to look for a job in this same area? Is this also something that, you know, floats my boat? Is this something that excites me? But I don't know what I, what I want to do. I don't know what I can do. I'm middle-aged. Who will hire me? And um, that comes with a whole different type of a crisis. Mhm. Maybe yeah, that's the average woman one. who's lost. <laughs> maybe an average woman who's lost herself in their marriage, and they've they've become all about um, what their husband wants and and how he wanted the household and how he wanted to raise the kids and what he wanted from from you and and you became you know you you became so used to thinking this is what he likes this is how it should be. This is the way it should go, and um, not thinking, oh, I don't know what I want, and I don't know more specifically if I can show what I want or if I can fulfill that. That's a little bit scary because it's changing, it's changing the narrative, it's changing the story, and so that's so, that's an yeah. important cross, crossroad as well. So, is this somebody who might still be married and is in that position? Absolutely. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, I think a a lot of women are still married. And and I think there's a fear in looking into themselves and saying, hey, I'm unhappy. And, you know, there are unhealthy ways to to fulfill that unhappiness. You know, any Mm -hmm. kind of an addiction would be an unhealthy way. And then there are healthy ways. But when you look at yourself in the mirror and you say I'm unhappy, it's scary because Inherently, it means I'm going to have to change. Something's going to change. If I deal with this unhappiness, something needs to change, and change is frightening. Yeah. And so it's a hard it's a hard place to go. 
yeah, change can be very frightening, and that's why a lot of people stay stuck. Um, so it was interesting what you just said, though, that there are unhealthy ways to deal with this. And so a lot of women might stay in an unhealthy relationship and be addicted to shopping, to eating, uh Pornography. I mean, there's so many things that people can get addictions to um, or turn to unhealthy ways of, like, people who have affairs um, because they've been in a crappy marriage and they think, well, I can't really leave, so let me find other ways to make myself happy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, yeah, so with with people like that who just feel like they can, you know, they're kind of finding unhealthy ways to deal with this, what would you what would you have to say to them? Um, that there's that they're they're what showing them what they're doing and saying what are what are you trying to fill that in? What do you what do you um, what makes you um, look out look outside your marriage for happiness? Mm-hmm. What is it that you're feeling and at the bottom of things and and identifying feelings would be um, a very very important thing to do and a lot of times. We don't know, we don't identify feelings. We go about our day without noticing what we're feeling. And so it's important as a start to notice, you know, what are your positive feelings during the day and what are your negative feelings? When are you going about your day and you're feeling happy or content? Or, or um, where is there, where are you feeling a spark? And, um, where do you feel good about yourself and where do you not feel good about yourself? And if you're, you know, if your husband is coming home and you're going about doing what you normally do and, and you, you dread it, that's, that's a big red flag. That's saying, ah, oh, there's something unhappy. And it doesn't have to mean an end of a marriage. It, it could mean let's, let's switch things up, whatever that is. Let's go through this crossroad and let's see what will make me happy. And I think identifying feelings also a little bit scary because when you identify a feeling, you're um, judging yourself for the feeling. I shouldn't. There's that horrible word, shouldn't. I shouldn't be angry. I shouldn't be unhappy. I have the house and the kids and and even a good career. And but I shouldn't. I shouldn't be unhappy. And and should insert. You know, not a good word. If you're unhappy, it's okay to be unhappy. It's okay uh-huh. to sit still with that unhappiness. And sometimes being unhappy is not equal to the drastic measure you're thinking of, you know, where you're taking that leap. If I'm unhappy, therefore I need to get divorced. If I'm unhappy, I need to leave my job. Or I have to move. And sometimes maybe it is, but sometimes it's not. So it's it's a hard thing to explore, but it needs to be explored. Mm-hmm. You don't always have to make a drastic change. You can sometimes make a small change. Exactly, exactly. I think there are, there are lots of good things in small changes, and, and then sometimes the small changes lead to um, much bigger changes. When I was um, when I was had four kids, I just had my fourth child, and I had not finished college. I just knew. I needed to speak to an adult. I needed to get out. Luckily, there was a college nearby, and I don't even know how I got the courage. I don't think I was even really thinking. I drove to the college, and I met with the registrar, and I said, you know, what can I do? And the registrar laid out a path for me, and, you know, it was a light bulb moment. He said, why don't you major in psychology and sociology? And I said, ah, that's it. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think light bulb moments happen to many people or often, or I don't think it's something you should expect, but I started slow and I went and I took my first class, which was child psychology. And I asked the professor, I told the professor I'm new at this. And he said, just do the work and you'll be fine. And I thought, okay, I can do that. And I started slow with one class and you know, the rest is history. So yeah, it just takes you got you know, your degree. a small thing. Yeah. One small yeah. step. I, I often have my clients look at, the first step instead of the whole staircase, you know, that whole Martin Luther mm-hmm. King thing, because every time they look at a, a, a task, it feels like the whole staircase. It feels like, oh, my God, overwhelming, not doing it, shut down, right? So taking that first step is so important. You just reminded me of a time when I was a young mom of 
three kids, I think, or two. I had first my first two, and I had just moved, and I hadn't been reading because I was so consumed with mothering and diapers mm-hmm. and all that stuff, and I wanted to get back to intellectual you know, stimulation, and so I went to the library, and I was a little embarrassed that I didn't even know where to begin, and so I met with a librarian. I just said, you know, these are the kinds of stories that I like, and I gave her some descriptions. She started me on a whole reading journey. I had to get over my fear of being not enough and my embarrassment of the fact that I hadn't been reading. Now I realize, like, it, it, nothing to be embarrassed about, but for me, I had shame around it, and I had to overcome that. That that's a, that's a great story. That really is a great story because, you know, we lose track of what brought us joy, what gave us joy mm-hmm. before whatever it is we were. And sometimes when you were a kid or an adolescent, what what made us happy? And and maybe it was reading, and maybe it was sports, and maybe it was writing or or art or or um, maybe you were interested in in math. You know, all those different kinds of things. When we get busy with life, and sometimes. You know, the life goes on and what I usually call is we're behind the narrative. Like everything is going and we're just following along and doing what we're supposed to be doing, but we're forgetting we're forgetting who we are and mm-hmm. and um and what really excites us and, and you know what what moves us. So it's very yeah. important for us to figure that out. Yeah, and 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 you're talking about something that most people don't tune into. It's you know, the joy, like they just think they have to go through the motions, but really life can be so much more. And it's not about spending a ton of money necessarily. It's not about having to, you know, have resources that you don't have because there's so much that's part of our inner world that we tune out of. So I'd love to hear some more tips for people who are stuck. So we have just to recap a little bit, um, to start to notice your feelings, the positive and negative, and where you start to feel a spark or feel good or bad about yourself, and Mm -hmm. um, listen to the shoulds and the shouldn'ts, and um, really get comfortable with sitting with uncomfortable feelings, because it doesn't always mean making drastic changes. And the last tip that you shared about asking yourself what brought you joy when you were younger, what brings you joy now, and start to really tap into remember who you are, or who you were, before all the stuff got in the way. Um, so is there any other strategy um, or tip that you can share about how to start getting unstuck? Okay, so um, another thing is where I think we go about our day a little bit mindlessly. And so... Um, we might be running errands and we might have, you mentioned toxic friends or toxic people in your life. And we might be saying to ourselves, this is, we have no choice. This is just what we have to do. And, and first it's good to acknowledge and to see, do you need to be doing every one of those things? Do you need to have that friend in your life? Is there another way around it? As, as you said so eloquently, you know, in a, in a, in a nice way. And, um, <laughs> What 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 are things that we must do, and what are things that we actually don't have to do? It's sometimes it's very surprising when you say, you know, I don't really have to do this. No, you know, when I when I ask my patients, do you need to do this? What would happen if you didn't do this? And then mm-hmm. and then they might say nothing. So another part of that is where um, women have this habit of putting themselves at the bottom of the list. You know, I have a patient currently who really, really um, needs to get away by herself, really wants to take a trip by herself. She has interesting and fun things coming up in the family, but she needs some time, and she needs to do it by herself. And so I said, that's great. Let's figure out where do you want to go. And then she said, I can't do that. I said, are you, are you going to enjoy being by yourself? Yes, I love to be by myself, and I love to explore places, and, and it's, it's my comfort place, and it's great. Then what? And I ask, what is stopping you? Well, you know, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So then I ask, why are their feelings more important than yours? Hmm. And I think we, we, forget, we forget that. 
we forget that sometimes we've put ourselves on the bottom of the list and we don't and we don't need to and we shouldn't there's yeah, that word should, should. Um, and that <laughs> that's not healthy. Care, right? <laughs> no, no, totally not healthy. And you know, we take care of others, and we feel like if we take care of ourselves, it's being, it's being selfish. That you know, that self care is not being selfish. So, mm-hmm. a tip I would say is um, find something that brings you small joy, just a small, you know, a smile to your face. What what makes you happy? What can make you happy? And if and if it's you know. Walking in nature, which sounds lovely, except if you're living in a city, or you know, a, you know, one night a week getting together with your friends, or or going to the library, you know, there's small things. Or even if you are just want to continue to learn, and then you go to your local college and you look at the catalog or look at it online, I should say, and say, oh, you know, I want to learn how to paint, and this is a good place to do that. But to start with something small and to map out how to attain that goal. And then also to acknowledge or to to be aware of or mindful of the feelings you're feeling while you're doing this. Is it getting you excited? Are you scared? Are, are you worried? And to, you know, sit with those feelings and say, you know, in the end, I'm just going to take this leap of faith. It's a small leap of faith. Because maybe it'll be the right thing and maybe it won't. But you're never going to know unless you do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really, that's great. Um, yeah, I think often we get into a rut and we don't inject some new life into our lives. So I love the, you know, these suggestions of walking in nature. And I have to say that even living in the city, because I lived in Manhattan for many years, and going into the parks, um, yeah. going, you know, getting out of the rut, like taking a bike ride. I used to bike ride up into New Jersey and going over the bridge. I mean, it's all part of getting fresh air, going, you know, you can you can get some slice of nature when you live in the city too. <laughs> um, right. And for some people going to the city, like I was in the city yesterday, getting together with a friend. So that's a ritual I have every year at this time of year. We have we always get together, go see the beautiful windows in Manhattan, and and get together for lunch and and usually a museum or a gallery, and it's our annual ritual. And so creating these rituals, creating something that you have to look forward to, really helps you to get out of that rut of your life is like the um, Groundhog Day, you know. Uh huh. <laughs> oh, that's a great that's a great way to. Absolutely great way to, you know, to put it. I think sisterhood, finding friends and a group of people. I have a group of, of women. We get together. We call ourselves, it's very corny, the Fab Five. And it's <laughs> been maybe seven and then sometimes three. And it goes on and we get together maybe two or three times a year. But we know we're there for each other. And it really it really gives you energy to go on with the rest of your life, to do things and sometimes do the mundane because, you know, you have – you have this sisterhood, and um, and it's and it's great to um, have that connection with somebody else, with other people, mm. or maybe just not in your everyday life. Yeah, and these are there's so many wonderful wonderful tips that you have, and you can tell that you have expertise in this area, and that you've been doing this for a long time, and really helping women who are stuck. And um, so I would love to hear a little more about, like, if if a woman is at a crossroads, um, and we, we didn't really go through all the, all, we went through, like, divorce, empty nest, um, losing yourself in a marriage, getting fired from a job, um, I would say also maybe loss, um, you know, going through loss or a health crisis. Sure. Right? Um, yes, absolutely. So if, if someone finds themselves stuck in some part, and, and sometimes it's not even anything major. It's just like I'm feeling blah, and I don't know why. Uh, they might be interested in, in coming to you and getting some support through this course. So it starts on February 3rd, right? 3rd. Mm-hmm. February yeah. the 3rd, 2020. You can sign up now at the link, um, dodielam.com. You could just go to your website, right? There's a link right on the homepage. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Um, and so walk us through some of the steps that you'll take women through in your course. So the first oh, – sorry about that. So the first thing um, we're going to do is to figure out if 
we are, how do we know we're stuck? You know, what, what helps us to know we're stuck? And some of the ways that we might know we're, we're stuck, again, is um, if we're, you know, wandering through our days mindlessly or if, we, um, if we're feeling depressed or crying for no reason. And so the first, the first order of business is to say, you know, um, you know where am I getting stuck? And we'll go through these cla- We'll go through the classes, and there will be, um, uh, I'm sorry, journal prompts. And hopefully, um, with the journal prompts, that will help you identify certain things that are going on and certain feelings that you have uh, in your life. So the other, the other, the other things that we'll do is we'll talk about getting centered, again, learning relaxation and doing mindfulness tools, giving mindfulness tools and helping us to become focused and to pay attention in our lives. We'll also learn more about feelings and especially the feeling of anger that um, often women are afraid to feel and suppress because um, it becomes an either-or situation either I'm angry and I have to do something about it or I shouldn't feel angry. And um, another thing we'll be doing is talking about um, what we, um, what, how do we lose ourselves? How do we lose ourselves in our life? And who do we listen to? And where did we listen that got us where we are? <clears throat> and how to extricate, extricate yourself from that. How do we listen to our own bodies, our own minds, our own feelings, and honor that as as best as we can? Mm-hmm. So that. these are just some examples of what will be mm. happening in the course. That's great. Um, often I have clients come to me with the same kinds of issues. I mean, usually related to relationships and dating. But I find that they've often lived somebody else's version of their lives, and they're still showing up, especially in families, being the savior, being the one who solves all the problems, instead of really focusing on what works best for them. And so learning how to undo the damage, really focus on who you are, what you need at this time in your life is so crucial. So I, I love, 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 love this. Um, so finally, Dodie, um, if you can share one final tip of what somebody could do who's listening right now, what they can do to start this process. So you can sign up for my class. You can, <laughs> you, right? You can um, pay attention to what you're what you're feeling in every part of your day, and you can um, focus on your body. Let's say. If you're going to pick up your children, do you have a knot in your stomach? What's making you have the knot in your stomach? Is it because you're bored or is it because you don't like where they're at, where, they're, where your children are at or what it is in, in part of your day? Um, and to, see, to be really, really aware of, of your surroundings and to see where it is that you can find your joy Whatever little joy it is, it's important because things are not all or never. Days are not all bad. They're not all good. Life is messy. But to pick up that those places that articulate, you know, who it is, what makes you happy. So yeah. I would start. I would start that way. That's wonderful, and I think you know most people are not conscious of that throughout their day. So when you start paying attention. I remember even just paying attention to how many times we're making decisions throughout our day. And some of it is very unconscious. But if you're choosing with consciousness, if you're feeling in your body, and our bodies are so wise, but we often disconnect and we don't trust those feelings in our bodies or we don't tune in. So this is just wonderful and really, really helpful, Dodie. And I really appreciate that you're doing this work and that you'll be helping so many women who are stuck to, as you say, to fly, 